First on film and entertainment, a very good morning to all and sundry. Olympic Games fever has hit. And the opening ceremony was absolutely spectacular. Spoilt somewhat by the rain, but hey, what they achieved, what they did. Yeah, there's controversy. There's usually controversy. So, okay, if you put that to one side, and I'm not dismissing anybody's concerns, I'm simply going to concentrate on the positives. I in the Eiffel Tower, obviously front and centre throughout. I just thought, wonderful. Celine Dion, you know, given what health issues she has, to get through that brilliant number that she portrayed as well as she did, she was back to her brilliant best. I, I was just ecstatic, really, really happy. And let's hope for a safe games because that's the most important thing. And obviously athletes are going to continue to give their all. So that is part of the Olympic game fever. I'm not sure that any in our crowd, Jackie Hamilton, Peter Krauss and Greg King, are really into the Olympics. Are you Jackie Hamilton or not? No, no, I'll pass on that one. Thank you, Alex. Not a, you don't even watch the Olympic swimming where where the girls are going to excel. You don't no, even watch that. Movie, Alex. Hey, sorry? I'd rather watch a movie. Oh, my golly. What a sad sack. That's not right. You've got to do it, Jackie. Come on. Yeah, two weeks of the year, that's all it is. Every four years. Come on. Pull your finger out. Be a patriotic Aussie. What do you reckon, eh? Can I get you involved? No, I agree fully with Jackie. Oh, my golly. So no football. I'm not no playing sleepy, yeah. You too, Greg. I don't. Oh, I, don't really, I don't really give it to rats about the Olympics now. But it's come professional sports people in there. Things like great games. You know, what's that got to do with sport? Well, hang on, hang on. The English language changes over time as well, Greg. So you know, why aren't the Olympic you're Games allowed? Going along, you're going along the long boat here, Alex. The, the oh. Olympics are supposed to be the best of the amateurs. That's where it started. When it's coming to it, it's become corrupt. All right, all right. When I'm not going to win this one, am I, Jackie? No, you're not, Alex. It's three against one. Oh, you Um, It's all right. It's nice to be right, even if the three of you are wrong. Let's talk about something more positive. Let's talk about Deadpool and Wolverine. And I, hey, hang on. This is first on film and entertainment. It is indeed. Thank you very much for announcing this. I should have done that. And basically... I thought that Wolverine was no longer with us, Jack. You, am I, obviously, I was wrong because in an alternative universe, in the multiverse, there must be lots of sort of uh, Wolverines out there, correct? Uh, uh, yes, you... he actually did appear in the early uh, stage of the film, in the very first scene, where it's actually his skeleton makes an appearance. He did. I, and that's actually very funny, quite frankly. Oh, hilarious. Yeah, it was absolutely hilarious. Yeah, and only again, you know, putting an arm over the um, the skeleton uh, was Deadpool. So look, it is irreverent. It's ribald. It's it's aggressive, most aggressive, and it's full of action and lots of laughs. I mean, really, lots of laughs. It's it's a deep dive into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Greg, can you tell me or Peter uh, how many members of the Marvel Cinematic Universe there are? I've totally lost count. There, there are dozens by now, are there not? Am I, am I only thinking that? I, 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 you know, if you if you lined them up next to each other, tallest to shortest, there'd be a few dozen, wouldn't there, Peter? Uh, I suppose so. I haven't been keeping track. Well, Greg, you know how I like to count members on stage. You can you can count the Marvel Cinematic Universe characters just just to satisfy me. Maybe you can sort of spend the next three months doing that for me, eh? Possibly. Well, you know, you got you got all the Avengers there. You have got all the some of the spin-off characters. So many to mention. And, and what about the villains of, of the universe as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, it seems to be growing at the rate of knots. I've got, a, I'm not a cartoon, sorry, a, a, what do you call it? Comic book person. But I presume they can, I mean, comic book heroes come and go and, and they're revived and then they're new, there are new ones. Are they still doing comic books about new characters? Do, does anybody know uh, within the Marvel Cinematic Universe or? Does it continue to expand as a universe with more characters? To, um, I've never asked that question, but it strikes me that it would as time goes on. No answers there? All right, I'll let you ponder that one. But look, there's a rivalry and there's been a dynamic between Deadpool and uh, Wolverine that's been quite fascinating for fans of especially the X-Men universe. And this one's all about the multiverse, the alternatives and uh, the, uh, to the, the realities that exist perhaps uh, in 
times gone by. So, yeah, Logan had marked the end of Hugh Jackman's Wolverine journey. That was back in 2017. But the concept here is that Deadpool looks for a live Wolverine in an alternative reality. As Jackie's mentioned, you've got skele skeletal remains. That's all that uh, we see in the opening scenes. But I suppose the universe seems to have got a hell in a handbasket and, and the pair of them, Deadpool and Wolverine, team, team up to save it from oblivion. That's what the, the concept is. And we're talking about action taking place six years after the events in Deadpool 2, which came out in 2018. Ryan Reynolds again plays Wade Wilson. He's the sort of long since retired as the mercenary Deadpool and lives this pretty nondescript life. In fact, he starts the movie as a used car salesman and he doesn't much take to the job. So then he's prevailed upon suddenly by a bureaucratic organisation which goes by the name Time Variant Authority, TVA. And he's, uh, he's asked to don the red and black again. What this proves, Peter Kraus, once and for all, is there's nothing as dynamic as the Essendon football team. Correct? Peter. Sorry, yeah. not at all. Yeah, Greg <laughs> King, you would understand that. You'd understand that deep-seated, heartfelt reference to Essendon, wouldn't you? I would, but I'm going to ignore it, Alex, because it's not what you call entertainment. I reckon it's most entertaining when we win. So, we uh, looking at it for a while. Yes, that's quite true. Now, having said that, there has got to be a way that Deadpool can convince a very reluctant Wolverine to join him on, on his exploits. And the pair of them confronts a character called Cassandra Nova, played by Emma Corrin, who's a mutant with telekinetic and telepathic powers. She also happens to be the twin sister of Charles Xavier. So this is when we get into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That name will mean a great deal to people who have seen uh, a large number of their movies or even some of them. So the TVA agent pulling the strings here is called Mr. Paradox, played by Matthew McFadgen. He'd like to speed up the death of a universe called Earth 1005. And to do that, he uses what's called a Time Ripper, R-I-P-P-E-R. It's a machine that can mercy kill timelines. As I said, there's a multiverse at play here, so there's all sorts of timelines that can be killed off and, and others come to the fore. So if you're confused, I was too. It is confusing as a narrative feature, isn't it, uh, Jackie? That it's not, you don't go along for a um, cogent storyline, do you? I didn't worry too much about that with this film, Alex. I, as soon as there's an acronym... And or, or a timeline or a ripper, I sort of just faded out. But I was quite happy following the story of who was fighting who and why. That was enough for me. Okay, okay. well, so simple pleasure, I suppose you can call it. I mean, it, uh, this is there's lots of inside jokes. I, look, I think this is one for the purists. Those people who really have immersed themselves in the MCU are going to have a ball with it. And you know, you you haven't. I understand that, and you still enjoy it. It. So, you know, that, that, oh, it sounds like you still enjoyed it. So that, that's a very, very good uh, sign. There are lots of inside jokes. Um, there's, there, there's not only inside jokes, there, there's references to the real world. And I'm deliberately avoiding any spoilers here. I thought that was extremely clever. It, it, it skirts the edges on a number of occasions. It's pretty risque, isn't it, Jackie? Oh, it's uh, quite foul in many places, but funny, funny obscene. I, I, I'm going to disagree with you that it's your comment that it's only for the purists because I'm certainly not a purist and I think that its witty dialogue takes it a long way into a broader audience. Well, yeah, I, I reckon the purists in particular are going to get the most out of it because they understand all of the references. I, I, I challenge you whether you understood everything when, when they were, you know, th there are so many in-jokes here that that's, I suppose the point I was making, but um... yes. I think that more than there are in jokes, but I think more than that, it, they poke fun at so much stuff, and you don't want to um, give spoilers here, but I do. Um, Be careful, please. I mean, just generally, you know, the sexual in innuendos right throughout. This is not a kids' film. They're very blatant, but actually really, really funny. 
Um, and they have a dig at everything, not just, you know, 20th century Fox and um, gender issues and uh, each other. Um, but there's that fourth wall, breaking the fourth wall, which really is one of the, I mean, it's been done a thousand times now, but it's still the way Ryan Reynolds does it, dead oh. really is very funny. And uh, uh, delightful. Uh, it's absolutely delightful. Notwithstanding that it is very, it is incredibly foul. I, yeah, I, I would not yeah. in any way agree with that. But then, you know, even just the, almost these little one line, you know, thing, for example, there's a terrible scene going on towards the end, which is very, very gory and violent, I might say, in a funny way, but still gory and violent. Um, with quite good special effects, actually. And um, and uh, Deadpool, instead of saying, you know, the, get the, the people are running away, let the people out of the way, he calls them extras. He does. That's right. That's yes. right. Yeah, so, so you don't... His, comment, his comment about um, Wolverine's um, physique since his divorce, yeah. and maybe referring more... To um, Hugh Jackman than to actually to Wolverine. I reckon, I reckon that's so smart, but also obviously Hugh Jackman would be you know, have to be comfortable delivering those lines. Uh, which what what was I think I think we referenced this um, last week or the week before when we talk about Scarlett Johansson and her husband having a go at her once a year on Saturday Night Live. Right? It, it's almost akin to that, isn't it, Jackie? Oh, but uh, it was brilliant. I, I was in a public screening, Alex. I didn't go to a media screening. And mm. I couldn't count the number of times not only I laughed out loud, but the audience did. You could hear people bursting forth with laughter at these very witty lines that Ryan Reynolds had a big hand in doing. He was a lead, he was the lead writer of, of the, um, the script on this. Yeah, there, there, there was a lot of joy in the room when when I saw the the media screening of this one as well. I, look, it's um, it's one of those things that it sets out to shock and provoke, and it does. There are lots of sequences where it does exactly that. And amidst all that mumbo jumbo, as I'd like to call it, that's built into the script to explain what's going down, and and it is complex. There, there's a lot of cleverness and hilarity, and I it's a, like what the way I describe this. Ryan Reynolds has found his true calling. He is just so beautifully manic as, as this motor mouth, right? That's what he is. Deadpool is a motor mouth. And you've got the contrast because Hugh Jackman says very little as Wolverine, but he brings a lot of... Um, he, he plays grunt. man. Yeah. He does. It, it, but he brings a lot of grunt and anger. That face, Jesus. That, geez, there's one, one scene there where... You're genuinely scared. I, 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 extraordinary. He's darn good. He does not miss a beat. Hugh Jackman. Both of them are great. I mean, they really bounce off each other beautifully. Um, I'd like to see them on stage together, Jackie. Wouldn't that be interesting? Sort of because I mean, I've I've seen a number of interviews, and the interviews have been hilarious as well. Well, maybe they'll so, do today. Put on a show. Yeah. Maybe they could do. I reckon it's going to be waiting for Gono. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They could. They could. I. I just think they are. So well paired, uh, you know. It's it's one of those, you know, got some some guys uh, form a, an unmistakable bond. These guys have. We've also got to mention Matthew McFadden. What what a what a delightful performance as a as a proper English cad. Um, you know, I reckon he stands out because of it, don't you, Jackie? And Captain America is good too. I don't know who plays. Captain... Yeah. Yes. Um. Oh, I've gone blank on on. Uh, off the top, maybe you can Google it while I'm talking. But uh, the other one, I kind of like Emma Corrin as the too cool for school Cassandra. I thought that worked as well. So it's it's all, but but we've got to mention one thing here, Jackie. What is it about dogs and movies in the past month? No, no, it's, think about... cats. it's been cats more than dogs. Yes, well, sorry, I mean animals. Oh, but it's... Sorry, that's my fault. But yeah, he... Here you've got a, uh, sorry, I, I just saw a show as well the other day where they brought a cavoodle on stage who was absolutely charming and delightful called Hudson after the Hudson River. And he was wearing a tuxedo bib, this dog Jackie. Oh, my heart melted. Everybody in the theatre just, and they say don't work with dogs and children and, and the dog was perfectly performed or behaved as well as performed. Anyway, 
getting back to this one. So we've had three, uh, three movies that have got cats in them. Now we've got one with a dog. Now, sorry, this has got to be the world's ugliest dog, doesn't it, Jackie? It, well, it's a... the ugliest dog, perhaps, but the loveliest name. Its name is Mary Poppins. Yes, but it's named Dog Paul. It's it's AKA Dog Paul. Mary Poppins, AKA Dog Paul. Love it. And, and I mean, it's got the longest tongue. Uh, now I I looked it up because I didn't know what sort of dog it was. Did you? Do did you have any idea when you saw it? No, I thought it might have been a Chinese crested or something, but it had too much fur for that, didn't it? Have you? Wow. Do you know what a Chinese crested is? I'd never heard of it. Certainly do. Wow. I've good friend you're right you are you're right Jackie my golly there's a first time for everything it's a Chinese crested a Chinese crested dog just until just very very recently called Po and what a delight that dog was really a friend of yours did you say a friend of yours yeah Uh, well this is a Chinese crested crossed with a pug Uh uh-huh that's that's why so I'm presuming you know the Chinese crested is more elegant I don't know is it you, no, you need... the Chinese crested, uh, uh, knowing that, the Chinese crested is the body of this dog, but there's a bit of pug in the face. Right, okay. Well, as I said, the longest tongue that I, and the the, the tongue in this one, I reckon it's more akin to an iguana's tongue, Jackie, uh, which basically uh, Mary Poppins uses to deliver Deadpool a face bath more than once. I think people have got the picture after that. So... I also love mention to the dog, Alex. We should also give special mention to the Honda Odyssey, which has a starring role as the superhero's vehicle of choice. And it certainly gets a big role in that. And I'd like to give another special mention to Cassandra's fingers. Really? Okay. I didn't notice her fingers, but there you go. You didn't, you did notice her fingers. They were right through his face. Oh, well, from that point of view, yes, okay. Yes, I did. I did notice that. Okay, so hang on, hang on. Why are we suddenly mentioning a Honda Odyssey? I mean, this is a, a straight plug for Honda, is it, or what? It was as hilarious as the dog. Okay. Uh, I I didn't think it was, but I yeah, I certainly noticed the gar. I'd rather I'd rather focus on the music choices. I thought the music was brilliant. Did you not? Uh, yes, and it was during the during a, a a Honda Odyssey particular scene when Greece was, um, oh, uh, Greece was um, playing. Hang on, playing. in a shape up. What's right. that? What it was called? Bomb yeah, 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 yeah. Greece. Hang on, uh, it's an emergency say. call coming through. Right, somebody's uh, answer the plumber's call. There, anyway, so then, then okay, so but it's it's primarily pop numbers. But not only, and I, it was inspired. They, they were hit, there was hit after hit after hit, and it was all get up and go, and you wanted to dance. And I just thought it elevated everything by another notch or two. And I, I just highly commend the choices. Music can make such a huge difference in a movie. Sometimes you don't notice it. Uh, this was front and center. It was kind of like another character in the piece, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was very good. So. I wanted to watch the movie. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Deadpool and Wolverine may be oh so silly, but it's also heaps of fun. And um, I reckon, as I say, aficionados would love it. Uh, I reckon others would, would, would potentially enjoy it. My only concern, I understand that all these superhero movies are long, but yeah, I don't know whether it needed to be 128 minutes, but uh, it didn't seem to trouble you, Jackie. No, no. Value for money for the punters. Oh, uh, well, okay, there we go. So Deadpool and Wolverine, MA rated, two hours, eight minutes, score out of 10 from you, Jacqueline. Eight and a half out of 10. And I'm giving it an eight out of 10. There you go. So I, I hope we've whetted the appetite for you you lads to uh, to go along and see it. Let us talk on JR 88 FM about joining the station. If you are interested in doing so, Community Station needs your support. 54 bucks a year, go to j-air.com.au and we'd love to have you on board. And there's programming, of course, 24-7, lots of interesting things to listen to and some pretty good music as well. So, yeah, why not give it a go uh, and become a member? So in terms of films that uh, we've, we've seen, that we've all seen, 
let's pick one that uh, all of you have seen. Greg, what what's a movie that you have seen that uh, we can we can chat about? The only two I've seen are, are the ones you put on your list, Alex and Mr. Blake at your service, and Long Legs. Okay, well, why don't we go Mr. Blake at your service? Because that's a really charming film. I mean, it's a, I, I kind of, I knew I was being manipulated, Greg, when I was watching it. I, I, I could feel the manipulation. Could you? A little bit, and I resisted it. Ah, did you? And Peter, what about you, 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 you scallywag who, you know, doesn't like certain things that I love? Did you find that the manipulation bothered you or did you go with the flow? Not particularly. I thought the story was well constructed and uh, some very good actors as well. And Jackie? You and you said you... And it had I... a cat in a central role. Mephisto. Oh. Mephisto, that's right. I, in fact, yeah, this is where we're talking about lots of cats and dogs. I thought Mephisto... By the way, we, we should uh, reference not just Mephisto... Well, oh, it's a beautiful cat, I was going to say. It's a Persian, isn't it? I didn't think it was a Persian. Yeah, and and um, the um, I, I just thought the cat showed full entitlement, right? And and I got I I, I googled who played Mephisto. I hope it's a union member. Uh, Nuchka is the cat's name, Jackie. So there's your starting point. All right. I, I thought the cat had a, a, a winning personality all of its own. I agree. I I agree. It's uh. Very good looking cat. That's what I say. Persians are beautiful to look at, and uh, yeah, this was terrific. So, look, it's del- this is delightful, feel good entertainment, as far as I'm concerned. Mister Blake at your service, PG rated, 110 minutes, fun filled romantic romp, and John Malkovich. Now, I associate John Malkovich, even though he's played some scurrilous roles, with with a sort of serious acting. This is about the most fun that I've seen him in a movie. I. I he plays Andrew Blake, successful English businessman, pining the loss of his wife of more than 40 years. You've got Diane, who was his wife, a French woman, and they met at a beautiful French manor when they were young, and he was love at first sight. So that's lovely. She was on Hall's holidays. Andrew Blake, the John Malkovich character, was hired as her English teacher. And during the movie, we, we see a couple of photographs of her in later life, but that's that's the only sort of apart from re- referencing her, that's the only visage we get of Diane. So they went on to have a daughter who whose name is Sarah and now lives in Australia. Since Diane passed away four months earlier, or well, four months ago, Andrew has been struggling, and he and Diane had promised each other one day they'd return to the estate where they met. So that's all well, well and good, but unfortunately. He's now making that pilgrimage alone, really not knowing how long he was going to stay for. Only he's mistaken for somebody who responded to an online advertisement for hired help that was placed by the estate's cook, whose name is... Now, I I reckon they called him Mrs. O'Deal, MRS. Am I correct, Greg? I can't remember. It would be Madame. Well, yes, but it's interesting. I I, I mean, I, I didn't understand why it was Mrs., Peter, maybe you can explain this. Uh, why was Mrs. when she wasn't married and had no suggestion that she had been married? Did you? Yeah. Was it? But did you? Were you conscious of that? Uh, not particularly, but perhaps because she was the uh, uh, in charge of the manor, uh, maybe she was given that honorific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw it as an honorific that didn't really have credence. But there you go. Anyway, I'll just call her a deal. O d i l e. So she's the one who placed the ad, played by uh, Emily uh, DeQuen, is uh, D-E-Q-U-E-N-N-E, Emily DeQuen. The owner of the property, Natalie Bouvillier, played by Fanny Ardent, is in lots of financial difficulties. She's in peril, actually. He can't pay her bills since her philandering husband died four years ago. And she'd like to open up the place for guests so she can get some money. But for that to work, she'd need more staff. And, of course, she can't afford to pay them. In fact, her baby is pretty eccentric, really. She She's desperately replying through her staff to junk mail in the hope of winning a fortune. And that's when Odile, the cook, not knowing anything of Andrew's background, who just sort of rocks up one day, comes up with a plan. He 
can become a proper English butler for a trial period, and in return for that, he can get room and board. And in quick time, with his good-natured banter, Andrew changes the dynamic at the princely home, and also the dynamic of the household staff who inhabit it, because, you know, obviously times are tough and in the finance stakes and uh, and things were pretty grim. And in the process of doing it, Andrew too finds a new lease on life because he thought basically the end was there when his wife passed away. And among those that are affected by Andrew's straight talking are the stickler for detail, the masterful chef who dotes on her spoilt cat, the one that we've mentioned, Mephisto, and that's of course Odile. But she's not the only one. Andrew befriends a man who took a shot at him, quite literally, took a shot at him. He's an odd job guy called Manier, played by Philip Bass, who works on the estate and has designs on Odile. And then there's the maid, Manon, played by Eugenie Anselin, who's ruining the fact that she's fallen pregnant and her boyfriend seems to have abandoned her. So there's all these little subplots that uh, tickle one's fancy as the movie progresses. It's been adapted to screen from a hit novel by Giles Lagardinier, which was the, the book was translated into 17 languages, sold more than a million copies across 22 countries, no less. And now he's the one who's written the screenplay alongside Christelle Hennon. It's, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's silly, it's far-fetched, absolutely, but twists are plenty. But surely it's going to put a smile on the faces of even the hardest of hearts. Maybe not yours, Greg, is that right? Yeah, no, I found this a little bit too slow and it just didn't work on me as, as it seemed, for example, you lot there. I thought um, John Malkovich was pretty good. As you said, he often plays serious roles, but he has done a bit of sort of comedy in the past with, or lighter roles. Um, I thought he was quite fine here. Um, it was nice. She brought a elegance to her role as the um, woman str- financially struggling to hold on to her home there. Um, and I thought the production design for the... Um, Mansion was quite good as well. Beautiful, Greg. I, t- I, I tell you what, I don't know whose mansion it is, but uh, I wouldn't mind a piece of it. It's a, it's a grand estate, isn't it? Mm. Yep, but, and it was really good there. But um, no, it just didn't quite win, win me over there. I liked Mephisto the Cat. Um, I thought John Maldowitz was good. But yeah, it's just something about this film. Uh, didn't quite work his charms on me, Alex. Oh, no, well, I mean, I thought they were charming. I thought the characters, the way they were played, the the surfeit of quips that elevate the movie above the ordinary. And, I mean, there's a sort of... Uh, John Malkovich, obviously, is the star. That, I mean, he takes the humour with gusto and there's a bit of a spring in his step, which I really enjoyed. There was a bit of an elegance. There's a stoicism about Fanny Ardent as a proud widow who fears for the future. And Emily de Quinn, who sort of deftly balances rigid routine with vulnerability. Uh, it's quite a standout character for me as Ordeal. And there was a timidity about Philippe Bass's manier a man who is highly capable professionally, but uh, somewhat lacking in the interpersonal skill department. You know, so that there's some really nice characters there, Peter Krauss, are there not? There are. Look, this is a, a quite an effective uh, rom-com that the French are so good at uh, producing. And in particular, even though the title is Mr. Blake at your service, which in fact is not the translation of the original French title. No, I noticed that. Why, Why again, that, that's not unusual, but I, I thought, what, what does the original translate to? Do you know, Peter? Yes, completely burnt. That's um, right. I did look it up and I'd just forgotten. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I, not, I'm not sure that completely burnt does it either, quite frankly. No. But, but, but because it's it completely burnt out, maybe, or burnt yes. out. But, um, yeah, strange title. Anyway. Yes. Anyway, so, but this film is really a vehicle, even though Malkovich is very good, it's a, a vehicle for Fanny Ardant, who is uh, such a loved yeah. French actress. And um, I thought the, the, the plotting of the story was quite effective. I didn't feel particularly manipulated. I thought, yes, I can see how the story uh, sort of aligns with their backgrounds and with their, uh, their movements forward. And uh, Gilles Lagardinier uh, is also uh, a good writer who's now uh, become a director. And uh, he's able to present his characters in a very positive and pleasant sort of way. I I found this one of the better rom-coms from France. And uh, 
I particularly enjoyed it, especially the way uh, it sort of concludes. Yeah, I, I, Jackie, you, you're a bit cynical about these sorts of things usually. Did, did you find it charming? Well, French rom-com is often um, an alternative word for torture for me. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm pleased you said that. If I if I was to sum it up, I couldn't have summed it up better. Thank you. You and I often have off off air conversations about this, and I got to drag, drag you kicking and screaming to the theatre half the time to see things like this. Well, they are because they're always about extramarital affairs, and they always tell the have the same jokes, and you always know they're so predictable. Uh, this one isn't so much a romantic comedy, though. This is um. This is a, a very different sort of vehicle um, for its comedy. And John Malkovich brings his own wonderful characterization to this and humor and his own slightly halting, careful um, French speaking um, voice to this, which I think gives it quite a distinct sort of feel. I really liked it. I don't think, I don't think um, Mr. Blake at your service quite sustained the pleasure to the end. Um, it got a little bit silly with a few of the ways uh, that they were making things happen. There's a robbery that doesn't work for me. Um, yeah. But what I did yeah, like about I really it, what, that, yeah, he, yeah. Mm. what I did like was the way a, a um, not an intruder, but, you know, an, a, a person from the outside comes into a situation and changes the as you said the dynamics but also each character is then allowed to develop themselves at the same time as the relationships between each of them develops and i really enjoyed seeing that progress mm. well look uh, greg you're going to give us low mark here i have no doubt based on what you've just said but i i do think that there's going to be a lot of people who enjoy the the pacing of this one and um I mean, look, one of the other things I noticed, and I'm not sure whether this stood out for you, uh, Peter, you're much better at accents than I am, but some of the French accents by the English actors may sound, well, I think they sounded a bit tortured. Did you not think that? Um, a little bit, but uh, you can excuse it. Yeah, I, I, mean, I just noticed it. But there's no doubting what I think is the warmth and charm in what's a fairy tale. I mean, that's what it is. So uh, let's start with you, Greg, and we'll work our way up. Score out of 10 for... This movie, which we talked about and which most of us enjoyed, Mr. Blake, at your service, PG rated 110 minutes. I'd give it five to five and a half. Sorry, it didn't work with it for me. No, and the Jackie reference that robbery scene, that's when it lost me completely. I thought, this is yeah. so out of character and it's not working. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Jackie Hamilton. I forgave the silliness and the frippery a little bit uh, because I enjoyed its lightweight entertainment and charm i think i think generally audiences um who go to a film like this will come away feeling good i've given mr blake at your service seven mm -hmm. i'm giving it a seven and a half peter kraus yes and i should mention the manor house i think it was shot in or was shot around was in scotland if i'm not mistaken oh. yeah okay. anyway oh, i how peter you've ruined it <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I was I was setting sail for Paris uh, and and was going to try and find this charming house, and I uh, basically I could spend years there and get totally lost and not find it. That's what you're telling me, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. No, I like the film, and I gave it seven out of ten. Okay, so I've got the high watermark there. Wow. Okay. On J eighty eight FM, first on film and entertainment with the one and only Gregory King. Peter Krauss, come on down, and Jackie Hamilton. Now, the teacher who promised the sea. And we saw this earlier in the... It was a centrepiece of the Spanish Film Festival, wasn't it, Peter? Yes, it was. Mm. So we we turned back the, the clock to the... It's, it's um, an emirated 105 minutes. In fact, I wondered whether it, quite frankly, shouldn't have been at least an MA rating, given some of the material in here. But anyway... You turn back the clock to the horrors of the murderous Franco regime, and it's a there's a highly personal search that goes on in the year 2010, 2010. Uh, it's based on fact, and this 
basically searching, involves a dying man's granddaughter desperately looking for her grandfather's father. So her great grandfather. Right? So she she's doing that for for her sort of for her grandfather, but uh, in the process finds out more about the family history. And it's a hunt that's going to see this woman, a single mother, played by Leia Costa, travel to a site where mass graves have been uncovered. And it's there that she meets and subsequently liaises with an elderly man who knew her grandfather. And the film juxtaposes revelations of 2010 with a dramatisation of events that occurred between 1935 and 1939. And the major focus is on a gentle and caring teacher who dared to defy the establishment. And his name is Antony, played by Enric Auger. And he's hired to teach in a small isolated village in a place called Burgos in Spain. So it's there that he establishes quite a delightful, intense and honourable relationship with his students. And the kids I'm talking about here boys and girls aged from 6 to 12 years of age. Now, he is an atheist, and Anthony Benain is his name, and so Benain's first order of business is to remove the cross from the wall of the schoolroom. Well, you can imagine how that goes down with the, the rather surly local parish priest. He's none too pleased about that. Parents as well as suspicious of his unorthodox teaching methods, which he's brought with him from France. So Bernain creates magic with his students through the use of a small printing press, which enables them to craft their own little books. And to the children's wonderment and excitement, Bernay promises to take them on an end-of-year trip to, quote, see the sea for the first time in their lives, because they're in inland. So with the best will in the world, unfortunately, expectation is about to turn to tragedy. And it won this film the Audience Award at the Gaudi Awards, celebrated annually in Barcelona. It's it's quite an emotionally wrought drama. And while an archaeological dig where bones are uncovered is what starts the movie, it's the flesh and bones manifestation of that which takes one aback much later in the film. film. The impact is is amazing, absolutely really powerful and heartfelt. The political undertones of the movie are apparent right throughout it with the arrival of Franco's forces in this sleepy village revealing the depth of fear and hatred for what's about to follow. And I kind of, I was watching it, I, I wa- my mind wandered back to the extraordinary Academy Award winning film, my favourite movie of all time, called Life is Beautiful, that is now 27 years old. So much promise was taken away with utter brutality. Enric Aucur does a really fine job as the idealistic teacher. He offers so much and he brings a sympathetic edge to his portrayal. A pall hangs over Leia Costa's role as the granddaughter as she uncovers clues to a dastardly family story. The director, Patricia Font, brings into sharp focus the shocking history of a nation that lost so many in absolutely appalling circumstances and and it's actually it's one that's still being dealt with today so you know it starts out in one way and takes on a totally different turn and that's why my mind wandered back to life is beautiful peter kraus your thoughts about the teacher who promised the sea i was very impressed by this film it's interesting to note how a number of spanish filmmakers are still coming to grips with the um, the dreadful Spanish Civil War and mm-hmm. Franco and the impact that his right-wing government had on the ordinary lives of people. Um, and that civil war killed so many people. And, of course, the framing story of this film is all about the discovery of a, a lost relative um, and uh, trying to come to grips with why and how this uh, situation happened. Um, It's a really nicely told story. The idea of the kids writing their own stories um, and uh, and also um, taking down the whole religious aspect 
um, of the local village uh, and letting the kids uh, think for themselves uh, and be free from uh, any manipulation or whatever, I think works extremely well. In fact, symbolically, the father-son relationship that occurs during the film where the father objects to the son uh, being educated, to being given ideas that he shouldn't be thinking about, um, uh, works extremely well throughout the film. I was impressed by it. I, I think it's a, an excellent film and I certainly recommend it. Yeah, exactly. Greg King? I haven't seen this one yet. Uh, okay, Jackie? Ah, uh, yes. I saw The Teacher Who Promised the Sea. My first thought was how similar it was to the almost currently running Radical, which was about uh, also based on a true story about an unconventional teacher and his unorthodox teaching methods who gets in trouble. This one was set in Mexico. I mean, the similarities um, were quite strong. And you could add that to the film um, Parallel Mothers, which was about a woman who, and that was set in Spain as well, I think, Penelope Cruz, seeking a relative um, related to um, mass graves. Um, for this film itself, um, yes, it certainly impressed to some extent, uh, although it wasn't quite so compelling. I did love the um, the trip back in time to this beautiful historic village and the old stonework and the laneways and alleyways and the people and the way they dressed. It's, I mean, it's very well, um, very well uh, produced and um, they've gone to a lot of detail. I thought it looked lovely. Um, the characters are great also. The children especially, we can really get to know their personalities and the way that they develop. I love the setting of it all. And um, as Peter says, it, the, the the setting um, of the of the times is extremely moving um, and culminates in uh, scenes that certainly would require, I would agree with you, Alex, an MA rating. I found it quite distressing. Yeah, I did incredibly. So shocking, appalling language like that needs to be associated with the the final scenes and, and even some scenes in the back half of that movie. The teacher who promised to see MA rated and it runs for 105 minutes. Uh, score out of 10 from you, Jackie. I'm going to give it a six and a half. Uh, the one thing I didn't mention was the downer for me in the film is the great granddaughter who does the seek. Uh, I found it quite a, quite a depressing character. Uh, I, yep. I didn't get much out of her. I agree totally with that. And I, it's funny, yeah. I, I'm taking it down because of that too. That was the pretense that started the storyline, but it didn't really, it, it didn't have the oomph for me that it should have. Peter, what did you think about that element? Yeah. No, I thought that worked pretty well because the whole uh, morose nature of the framing story uh, made the, uh, the past uh, even stronger in terms of why uh, such devastation could happen during the uh, Spanish Civil War. Anyway, I really liked the film and I gave it 8 out of 10. You gave it 8, Jackie. I'm sorry, what did you say? You gave it a 6.5? 6.5, yes. 6.5, yeah, and I'll give it a 7. So we're sort of, um, yeah, we're, we're, all, we're all sort of around the mark, but uh, somewhat different. Let's go to a movie called Long Legs, which Nicolas Cage, it's funny, sometimes I see him in a movie and I think, oh, gee, it, it's not one that I... You know, I, I would really recommend it. It's a pretty sort of B-grade, if 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 B-grade movie. And then I see him in others and I say, wow, this guy can really act. I kind of get torn between the two. How do you feel about that, Peter, in terms of Nicolas Cage as an actor? Is it the scripts that he, he's given? or Because there's not a uniformity in terms of performance, I, I reckon. Well, no, it varies considering uh, the sort of script he's given, but he also produces a lot of the films, so he knows what he's getting into. Yeah, well, and, and Greg, what's your view of Nicolas Cage? Do you, do you think he's an accomplished actor or he can be a bit uh, spir spirel? Well, he's an accomplished actor. He does some good performances, but then he does, does some films um, for the, purely for the money of that, and, and they're not very good like that. Um, 
USS Indianapolis film, which was a uh, pretty ordinary. So he does a few really pro- um, elite projects, really good projects, uh, allowing him to sh- spread his stuff. But then he does some stuff just purely for the money, which um, are less um, enjoyable or less um, yeah. Um, yeah, I get get the right. Well, okay, Long Legs is MA, it's 101 minutes, and uh, it, it's an unrecognisable Nicolas Cage. I, I I tried throughout this entire movie to make him out, and I could not do that. Could you, Greg? Yeah, could he's you? Very, he's very under layers of prosthetic, didn't he? Make up, yeah. Aaron, uh, Peter, did you did you see any twinkle in his eye or anything that, that manifests itself as Nicolas Cage? I, I, I defy anybody to. No, I didn't at first. It took me a long time to recognise uh, Cage. Yeah, well, I mean, look, he's the effectively the devil incarnate. It's a decidedly creepy crime horror thriller, Long Legs, and it, it starts as a figure sitting in a car looking at a little girl in a small house, and she comes out to see who this figure is. Suddenly, he confronts her, and at first we only see him from the nose down. I thought that was a really good piece of, of cinematography, and this is what... The figure says, there she is, the almost birthday girl. Oh, but it seems I wore my long legs today. What happens if I, at that point, the opening credits roll? And it turns out that that day was the 13th of January, 1974. The day before the girl's ninth birthday. Now, there's a potency to that, which will sort of come back later in the movie. And after the initial credits, we cut to an FBI briefing. There's a manhunt going on. And one of those undertaking a door-to-door search with an assigned partner is called Agent Lee Harker, played by Maker Munro. She's quite a taciturn figure. Instinctively, she chooses the house where the suspect is holed up. And given her psychic abilities, she's got a sixth sense, Harker is subsequently assigned to a particularly baffling case. The FBI is on the manhunt for a serial killer who has instigated the murders of 10 families carried out by their own fathers over a period of 30 years. But while the dads perpetrated the slayings inside their own homes, they appear to have been driven to do that from the outside. And each time a letter was left with the bodies written in a coded alphabet and not in the hand of anyone connected to the families. So all of these letters were signed long legs. So what the families had in common was they all had daughters with birthdays on the 14th of any given month. Remember, the nine-year-old girl or the girl about to turn nine was on the 13th, right? But this is what they had in common. The daughters all had birthdays on the 14th. So Agent Harker goes to work under the auspices of another veteran agent called Carter, played by Blair Underwood. And it's work that will uncover skeletons in the younger agent, Agent Harker's closet, that will bring her face to face with the forces of evil. And in the process, we uncover she had a rather uneasy relationship and still does with her God-fearing mother, Ruth, played by Alicia Witt, who was a nurse for eight years. So it's, it's this complex web of a movie, Long Legs, well conceived and executed, if you pardon the pun. There's a lot at play with this one, and it's tense throughout. Takes quite some time, considerable time, to piece the threads together. In fact, I reckon it's all the better because of that. In other words, you really have to work at it as a movie. Some really bloodthirsty imagery, and you need to have a strong stomach, but most of it is really suggestive rather than visual or visceral. So it's the work of a writer and director called Oz Perkins and influenced by uh, chiller thrillers like uh, The Silence of the Lambs uh, with uh, Anthony Hopkins and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It it really has a sinister underbelly. And as it progresses, the noose tightens around the neck of Agent Harker and her aloof, her aloof methodical character as displayed by Maker Munro in a role where she really does impress it's appropriate, the material that we are witnessing. I thought Blair Underwood was convincing as a natural-born leader without that sense of 
psychological sense, the sixth sense I spoke about that Agent Harker possesses. He, he's calm but insistent. And then Nicholas Cage is off with the pictures. He's in a world of his own. He's deranged. He's, he's demented. He's driven as the villain from hell, long legs. I thought the mil- music as well by Elvis Perkins underpins the scary nature of the picture, which really does continue to work away at our psyche. And dare I say, long legs is the stuff of nightmares, as it set out to be, Greg King. Well, some people have compared this to Silence of the Lambs, which I can see some similarities, and if a female FBI agent hunting a serial killer. But for me, um, Silence of the Lambs, films like Seven, were much superior to this one. Uh, it's a bit creepy, but it's more the um, way it's put together with the sound design, which is very creepy, the claustrophobic settings, the bleak cinematography all add to the atmosphere there. The film itself is not particularly um, tense, I didn't think. Um, and Osgood Perkins is the son of Anthony Perkins, who starred in Psycho. I think he's learned a bit from um, yes. the experiences on that film there. Uh, for me, it, okay, um, Maker Ma- Munro plays a so- sort of tough, feisty, determined FBI agent, which is good, but there's... As, uh, Nicholas Cage, who dominates the film with his performance, is not in a lot of scenes, but he is very creepy. It's an unhinged performance um, from him. Um, and, yeah, uh, but, yeah, it just wasn't quite um, a tense, as tense as it could have been. But the, uh, And it's derivative a little bit of what quips from a lot of other better films, I thought. What about you, Peter? I was quite impressed by it. I think it's... Uh taken the horror story into a slightly different dimension and uh, it is quite creepy as as Greg said but uh, I think it's uh, it's better than that because uh, it has a resolution which uh, uh, causes you to think um, a little bit about how uh, people can be infiltrated if you like to put it that way um, and it's very effective so I liked it oh good stuff so uh, score out of 10 Peter uh, I gave it seven out of ten. Right, you gave it seven, and I gave it seven and a half. And Greg, six to six and a half. Six to six and a half. Okay, so we're all around the the sort of seven mark on on that one. Well, look, boys, thank you very much indeed for your participation. Jackie's had to fly away, so thank you, Jackie, in absentia. And we will do it all again very soon on first on film and entertainment. Wish you well, Greg, Peter. Please, at least watch a little bit of the Olympic Games for me. Do it as mates, yeah? Hey, what about it? Folks, be good to one another. Enjoy the Olympic Games and enjoy First on Film and Entertainment when we present it. Catch up with you very soon.